In the high summer of 1940, the battle for the survival of Britain and of freedom in Europe was not being fought on the beaches, but in the clear blue skies of southern England. The story of the Battle of Britain is a story of weapons, a technological story as much as it is a story of collective national heroism and the individual courage of young men. In this, it is a retelling of an old tale. Since the very earliest days of warfare, of human conflict, the need to survive, the need to defend yourself against your enemy, has spurred the invention, innovation, and the creation of ever more destructive and more terrible weapons. And the weapon that hits harder, faster, or further, has always been countered by either an even more powerful weapon, or by a better defense, better armor, a better shield, better ways to hide. To understand the Battle of Britain, we must look back before the war, when military thinkers all over the world were imagining, were theorizing, about future conflicts. At the turn of the century, it can be hard to realize that the invention of powered flight is an event that exists just still within living memory. That flight of Wilbur and Orville Wright was only in 1903. In the interwar years, aircraft were just one of a series of breathtaking inventions, miracles of science that had amazed the world. Their role in warfare during the conflict of World War I had grown. In 1914, the flying machines were consigned to reconnaissance, to acting as spotters and spies. By 1918, the war had pushed the technology forward, and specialized aircraft, war machines, bombers and fighters had developed. The Great War had seen the first strategic bombings of civilian and industrial targets. Ordinary people far from the front, where armies struggled, experienced the terror of aerial attack. By that war's end, the technology had advanced such that in 1919, a British strategic bomber was able to make the first crossing of the Atlantic Ocean. Military theorists seized at the airplane as a decisive weapon that could change the nature of warfare forever as a way out of the horrors of trench warfare. Politicians saw the airplane as an awesome machine that could win wars cleanly, without casualties, in a matter of days. It was believed by politicians and soldiers in all countries that the bomber would always get through. Between the wars, it was widely believed that the next war would be fought with a short air battle, where one side's air force would be defeated, conceding air supremacy. Then, under threat of absolute destruction from bombers, victory would be conceded without any actual bombing of cities taking place. Perhaps warnings would be dropped into the centers of industry and populations would be evacuated in panic and then denied to the enemy by the use of poison gas. Because the theory held, no sane government would risk devastation in this way. Wars in the future would be clean, short, with minimal deaths and destruction. Experience between the wars had seemed to prove that the bomber would always get through and that air power would result in the predicted victory. Nazi bombers in support of Franco in the Spanish Civil War had wrought apocalyptic devastation upon Spanish Republican cities. The fate of the Basque city of Guernica was held up as a warning to the world of aerial power. The British Royal Air Force had ruthlessly used bombing to economically and painlessly, without British casualties, police the wilder parts of the British Empire, bombing the villages of rebellious tribes in Arabia and Afghanistan, sparing the cost and the risk of British ground troops. During the 1930s, the Italian Air Force had used aircraft and poison gas to subdue the forces of Emperor Haile Selassie in Ethiopia. Of course, these easy successes were an illusion. The Spanish Republican government had no air force, no air defense system that could deal with what were state-of-the-art German aircraft. Guernica was a soft, undefended target. The tribespeople that the Royal Air Force intimidated had no air defense, no shelters, and no fighters. The RAF even had the luxury of marking gigantic figures and directions on the surface to aid navigation. The Ethiopian society that Italy attacked was medieval in its structure and technology.
Even so, the Second World War, up to the onset of the Battle of Britain, had seemed to prove that air power was irresistible. Soldiers from Poland to France, across the entire continent, had cowered, fled in panic, and died under remorseless attack by German aircraft in close support of advancing German armies. Again, this success was not a proof of the air power theories. The use of aircraft as close support to land forces is a long way removed from strategic air power used by one industrialized, advanced country to defeat another. The blitzkrieg that had swept across Europe was a new way of making war. But it was a theory that combined tanks, planes, and infantry to defeat the enemy's army. In the Battle of Britain, for the first time, air power was on its own in an individual struggle. Air force versus air force, unaffected by the needs of soldiers and sailors. History likes to assign dates to the start and end of events. Rarely are events seen at the time so clearly. The Battle of Britain began at the instant that the Battle of France ended. All through July of 1940, there were skirmishes between fighters, minor raids as the two air forces fenced, feeling for their enemy's weaknesses. Hitler named August 13th as Eagle Day, when the main assault was to begin. Hitler's Führer Directive 17 ordered the Luftwaffe to overpower the English Air Force with all the forces at its command in the shortest possible time to attack the flying units, ground installations and supply organizations and the aircraft industry. The objective of the German Air Force on Eagle Day was simple, to destroy the British Royal Air Force completely. Then the Luftwaffe would be able to attack at will striking anywhere, anytime, it would have air supremacy. With air supremacy, the British Navy would be powerless to prevent the German Army's proposed river crossing of the English Channel. Operation Sea Lion, the invasion and conquest of the British Isles would begin. All over northern France and the Low Countries, the Luftwaffe gathered all its strength. The ancient Chinese philosopher of war, Sun Tzu, held that Every battle is won or lost before it is fought. That every factor determining the outcome of a conflict is already in place. In the men, in the weapons, in the geography, in the minds and the plans of the commanders. In that summer of 1940, as the two air forces prepared to fight, each had their strengths and weaknesses. The RAF was small, numbering little more than 600 fighters the British bomber force was to be irrelevant in the battle. But the fighter planes were the twin legends of the war, the Spitfire and the Hurricane. The Hurricane was a devastating attacker of the German bombers. Its armament and its design caused heavy losses to the Luftwaffe forces. Once the pilot had the enemy in his sights, the Hurricane made kills easily and quickly. The Hurricane was a dependable, strong aircraft that made its pilots feel safe. Its body was sturdy, and the plane could resist punishment and damage and get the man home. The Spitfire was undoubtedly the most beautiful aircraft. The smooth lines came from the natural needs of aerodynamics and were made possible by advanced revolutionary technology. The Spitfire, by far the faster and most agile, its flying qualities meant Spitfires were the planes of choice to engage the opposing German fighters. A myth of the war was that the Spitfire won the Battle of Britain for the RAF. The truth was that hurricanes were far more numerous and shot down many more German aircraft. 
hurricanes were far easier and cheaper to build, and the better destroyers of bombers. The two aircraft together were to be the twin nemesis of the Luftwaffe. The Luftwaffe, however, possessed numerical superiority. A huge force of bombers more than 1,000 aircraft strong, built to three designs, the Heinkel 111, the Dornier 17, and the Ju-88. The Heinkel and the Dornier both suffered from light bomb loads and poor defensive armament. The Heinkel's peculiar nose design made its crews feel intensely vulnerable. The Junkers 88 was the best German bomber, only slightly slower than the British Hurricane, and although a small aircraft could deliver its bombs very accurately, as its airframe could take the stresses of dive bombing. All were medium bombers, not capable of carrying the devastating bomb loads seen later in the war. It was to be a major failing of Germany that its aviation industry never produced a working heavy four-engine bomber the type that was to prove so destructive later in the war. As so often, the vanity and pride of the Nazi dictatorship was its downfall. The small medium bomber enabled a huge air force to be cheaply and quickly built. Masses of the medium-sized planes were more impressive as they flew over the Nuremberg rallies. In addition to the three medium bombers, there were 300 Stuka dive bombers. Their distinctive wing shape, the result of a design capable of near vertical dives that enabled a light bomb load to be delivered with deadly accuracy. They were slow and clumsy planes in normal flight, and while these aircraft had terrified soldiers on the ground, they were yet to be tested in an air force to air force battle. The other arm of the Luftwaffe's strength was its fighters. At the start of the Battle of Britain, the Luftwaffe was equipped with two machines. The Messerschmitt 110 was a twin-engined and heavily armed fighter, and its crews were regarded by the Nazi leadership as the elite of the Luftwaffe. In fact, the most dangerous adversary of the RAF in 1940 was the Messerschmitt 109 a single-seat, single-engine fighter, the equal of the Spitfire, and faster than the Hurricane. The angular lines of the 109 made it less naturally agile than the Spitfire, but the heart of the aircraft, its engine, gave the German plane its own advantages in air combat. Evenly matched in speed and armament, for as long as the war is remembered, the argument will be which was the best, whether Spitfire or ME-109 was the superior fighter. The total strength of the Luftwaffe was over 1,000 bombers and more than 800 fighters, against which the Royal Air Force could muster 600 Spitfires and Hurricanes. There was far more to the technology of the Battle of Britain than simple statistics of bomb load and rate of climb, of top speed, turning circle, and weight and rate of fire. The battle could be won and lost in the aircraft factories. The Battle of Britain was a battle of attrition. The side that lost most planes, that lost the more pilots, would be defeated. With equal losses on either side, the side that could build and replace lost planes the quicker would, in the end, be the victor. A fact of history is that in the summer of 1940, the British factories could easily outproduce the Germans. 500 Spitfires and Hurricanes could leave the production line every month. The German figure was less than half that. Attrition of machines, and attrition of pilots. The most advanced aircraft in the world 
is a sort of cardboard if no pilot can be found to fly and fight with the aircraft. Fighters like the 109 and the Spitfire were demanding planes to fly, needing skilled pilots. The Spitfire's speed, agility and responsiveness to control would terrify the beginner. In this, the Germans had the edge. Huge numbers of conscripted young men passed through the Luftwaffe in the 1930s and Germany could call on 10,000 qualified pilots. In comparison, Britain had just over 2,000 young men scraped together from amateurs, university flying clubs and the remnants of the Polish and the Czech Air Forces. The RAF could train only 50 new pilots a week. Yet, the technology of the battle had another dimension. Radar. The story of radar is a classic example of how human inventiveness makes connections. In between the wars, a serious question was asked of British aircraft research. Could radio waves be used as death rays, stalling the engines of enemy aircraft or boiling the blood of pilots, both of which were thought theoretically possible? The scientific reply was, that radio waves could not be made strong enough to do such things, they would just bounce off. But a connection was made. Flying aircraft were causing problem interference with transmitters of the BBC, and the idea of radar was born. Between the wars, finding and tracking incoming attacking aircraft was thought an impossibility, and was central to the belief that the bomber would always get through. The use of radar was to give the RAF the crucial advantage in the Battle of Britain. It would be wrong to suppose that Britain alone had radar. In 1940, all major countries had radar programs, but British work was the most advanced. Most importantly, Britain understood what the new technology meant, had worked out how to use radar, how to process the information, and use the intelligence gathered to control and direct fighters towards incoming bombers. Britain was the only country which, at the outbreak of war, had built a complete network of radar stations. Germany did not realize the value and importance of the technology. Their own experiments in radar were leading in different ways that blinded them to the value of the British system. Still, yet more factors determined the way the battle would be fought and the ability of each side to win victory. The battle was fought in British skies. German aircraft had less time over their targets before needing to return, rearm and refuel. Downed German pilots and damaged aircraft were lost forever. British men and machines could be returned to action. In so many ways, the two air forces were evenly matched. Strengths and weaknesses evened out in determining the chances of defeat or victory for both sides. A weakness of the German side was their battle plan. Even though they knew their clear goal was the destruction of the RAF, Germany's leaders had no clear idea as to how to achieve that aim. The course of events in the skies of Britain in the weeks of the campaign against the RAF were marked by abandonment and changes of plan, improvisation and bad intelligence, bad guesswork, that seen with the standpoint of history brought ultimate German failure. Overall, the Germans believed that if they could bring the RAF fighter force to a decisive battle, they would destroy the fighters and the invasion could begin. Luftwaffe leader Goring called it the knockout punch. Hitler even hoped that once the RAF was destroyed, Britain would see sense, capitulate without the need for invasion. The Battle of Britain divides into a number of phases. In the first phase on Eagle Day, the Luftwaffe attacked a wide variety of targets, some airfields, the naval dockyards at Portsmouth, shipping in the English Channel, some radar stations, aircraft factories, and so on. The aim? To rain blows everywhere, to provoke the RAF into a fight. The RAF held its own in this first phase, and crucially, the radar stations were not systematically attacked again after that first day. German intelligence did not realize how effective the British system was. The result was that the attacking forces were always met by British fighters. 
The skies of southern Britain were full of aircraft. The newsreel showed proud home guards standing over downed aircraft in the fields. August 20th, in the British Parliament, Prime Minister Winston Churchill paid his legendary tribute to the young pilots of the RAF. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. The few, and that was the point. The pilots of the RAF were few in number. Although Britain was managing to replace the losses of aircraft, the pilots were growing ever smaller in number. After two weeks, the courage of the pilots and the technology of the planes and radar meant that the expected result was not happening. The RAF was still in the air. From August 24th, a new tactic emerged. Impatient for success, the Luftwaffe focused solely on attacking the RAF's airfields. The Nazi thinking was that the RAF surely would have to rise in its entire strength to defend itself and its own capability to fight. The attacks were made by small groups of bombers accompanied by large formations of fighters. With this strategy, the Luftwaffe began to slowly gain the upper hand. At some bases, the ground crew, without which the RAF could not fly, were in mutiny, refusing to come out of shelters. For the first time, the rate of destruction of RAF planes was overtaking the rate at which new fighters could be built. In early September, the situation was at breaking point for Britain. On September 7th, this strategy, which was winning, was dropped. The Germans suddenly mounted mass daylight raids on London. Impatience that victory was slow in coming caused the change. Again, the idea was to provoke the RAF into a mass defense of the capital and bring about decisive defeat. The Germans abandoned all subtlety of tactics, of feints and diversionary raids, and simply threw all their strength in mass attacks, in increasingly desperate attempts to provoke a big final battle. In fact, they presented the RAF with ever larger and easier targets of bombers. If you look for a reason, it is in intelligence. Both sides had inaccurate estimates of the other's strength. The Germans had underestimated the RAF strength at the start of the battle and they never had an idea of the true level of the RAF strength. They were unaware of how bad things were for the British. They were seeing their own strength destroyed with no effect. Had the Germans known the true position, they would surely have persevered with attacks on the RAF's bases with who knows what effect on the course of the history of the world. The change of targeting by the Germans initially caught Britain's air defense system off balance and wrought sorrowful destruction. On September 7th, only 92 anti-aircraft guns defended the capital. Even though their number was rapidly increased, those barrages were mostly useless, only driving attackers to higher altitudes from where the same weight of bombs fell.
But as the raids continued, the RAF reorganized and found that in the new mass daylight raids, the Luftwaffe was offering easy targets and the balance of losses swung back heavily toward the British, gradually eroding the Luftwaffe's strength and confidence. The logical thing for Hitler to do, the sensible thing, if you like, was to stick with their plan to continue the strategy that was slowly degrading the RAF's capability, destroying British bases, destroying British planes. The Battle of Britain was a war of numbers. Each day, the Luftwaffe and the RAF claimed to have won the day. Each exaggerated their own victories and minimized their losses. The ability of each side to tell fact from fiction, to know what was really happening, was a crucial factor in determining the outcome of the battle. The failure of nerve, the decision to end attacks directly against the opposing air force, was a turning point of the war. The Battle of Britain exists in myth as well as in history, but it's no myth that the future of freedom from the whole dark science of Nazi tyranny lay in the hands of little more than two and a half thousand young men. History likes to assign clear dates to the start and end of events. In fact, the real happenings tend to be far more blurred. Throughout early September, the mass daylight attacks on London continued with heavy German losses. Hitler realized the RAF could not be defeated. The invasion of Britain could not happen. The raids on London gradually turned from daylight to night, the object no longer the destruction of the RAF, but of London. The big plan, the strategy for defeating Britain, different. While the big picture was that Germany had suffered a major defeat, had failed to take victory on offer, this might not seem the case for the citizens of London. The Blitz was yet another test of the theory that air power alone could win a war. Win by breaking the will to resist of a population, by inflicting terror and exhaustion. Once again, the most carefully argued of peacetime theories as to how the next war would be won was put to the test of actual war, and the course of events was to confound the best thought-out plans. In the first phase of the Blitz, bombers came every night. Indiscriminate, vaguely aimed attacks were made on the docks on the East End. After the heavy losses of the Battle of Britain, the Blitz was a happy time for the Luftwaffe, with German losses of only 1% of sorties flown. The British defences, for all the roar of anti-aircraft artillery and the ranks of barrage balloons, were impotent. The guns were told to fire indiscriminately for the benefit of civilian morale. Indeed, it is legendary how the British people showed that bombing does not break the will to resist, and in many cases, stiffened resolve. The British civilians climbed over the rubble to carry on their lives in defiance of Hitler. Looking back from a world where war and airstrikes are reported as breaking news, where the perception of a war is as important as the actual strikes, it is perhaps hard for us to see the Blitz as a media event, as news information, the same way as we see wars fought over 50 years later. Thanks to the Anderson shelter, we're quite safe. I think he dropped a couple of bombs on us and it shook the Anderson shelter like very ill. But uh, when I had the four boys talk to me, I was quite contented. The Blitz was the German attempt to make the British people reject the belligerent defiance of Churchill, to weary them of war and prepared to accept peace on any terms. The Blitz was presented by the British in ways that outraged. 
Images of business as usual, of prime minister, of king and queen with the victims of this terrorism were used to present the leadership as all in this together with the people. The pictures of ordinary innocent civilians made homeless, turned into refugees in their own country, was used in a drip feed of propaganda to turn U.S. public opinion against the Nazis. The truth of the Blitz, as with all truth, is more complex than the fiction. In some places, civilians did flee the cities of Britain in panic. Some people did loot from bomb wreckage. Churchill was not always greeted with cheers. The British Communist Party tried to stir agitation that workers were being allowed to die through lack of air raid shelters. We live in a world where politicians are too often led by public opinion polls. Polls are not new. It's a simple fact that in secret Gallup polls taken by the British government throughout the Blitz, 80% of the population believed in ultimate British victory. With the Battle of Britain a failure, and his main enemies still defiant, though bloodied, what now was Hitler's plan? What now could be his strategy for victory? On October 12th, Hitler cancelled Operation Sea Lion, the invasion of Britain, and a new German strategy was unfolded. Rather than deliver a knockout blow, Hitler now chose to pound around at the edges to wear Britain out. Pressure on Britain would be increased by attacks on ever more fronts, stretching both Britain's resources and the will to continue. The incessant pressure of the Blitz would stretch the nerves. Diplomacy would be used to add to Britain's enemies, inducing more and more countries by either threat or the offer of the spoils of victory to come over to the Axis. In late October of 1940, Hitler met with two men he thought could be an aid to this plan. In Spanish dictator Francisco Franco, he sought an ally who would assist his strategy by seizing the British base at Gibraltar and so closing the Mediterranean to British use, increasing the pressure on North Africa and Egypt. In return, Spain was offered the reward of France's North African colonies. Many historians call Franco a fascist. That he refused to be involved with the war and kept Spain neutral reveals a fascinating dimension to his character. Showing him not a revolutionary politician with a set of beliefs like Hitler, but rather a simple conservative, shrewd and ruthlessly realistic, who thought only of his and his country's interests. Hitler was to say of his meeting with Franco, I would rather have three or four teeth extracted than go through that again. Hitler met Vichy French leader Pétain and again offered the bribe of colonies. The French territory promised to Spain would be replaced with former British territories. In return, Vichy France had to enter the war on the German side. Pétain showed some of his old stubbornness and refused to become further involved. Already in mid-September, as part of this new strategy of encirclement and a widening of the war, Italy had attacked Britain in Egypt. Italian forces based in Libya, which was then an Italian colony, had invaded Egypt, which was a British protectorate, ruled as part of the British Empire. An ancient country, significant in world history millennia before, was once more a player on the center stage of world events. This was not part of Mussolini's usual posturing, a vainglorious move to make his fascist state look like a new Roman Empire. There was a clear, focused, strategic goal for this attack. The purpose was to cut off British supplies of oil from the Middle East and Arabian states, from Iraq and Iran, then all under British domination, if not direct rule. Without these supplies of oil, Britain would simply lose the war. The invasion of Egypt would cut the Suez Canal, an actual and symbolic link to Britain's worldwide empire. Over the next two years, the Western Desert was to become one of the most spectacular and dramatic theatres of war the world has ever seen. A place in which legendary leaders would emerge and where the names of individual units would mark their place in military history. It would be a war of dramatic movement, over stupendous distances. 
the Western Desert was not to be some grim push, a grinding down of the enemy. It would be a conflict with astounding reversals of fortune with both sides riding astride a seesaw of victory and defeat. The huge, open, featureless space of the desert and the absence of towns and civilians made for a war of easy movement suited to the new mobile armored tank armies. It was to be a war fought with what would be seen as old-fashioned chivalry and respect for the opponent. Later, when Germany became drawn into the conflict, the absence of SS troops removed the worst excesses of brutality and reprisal that were to be found elsewhere. With hindsight, the Western Desert Campaign would be of major significance in the eventual outcome of the war, but the numbers involved were tiny compared to forces engaged elsewhere in the world. Italy's North African Campaign of 1940 was the first time that Mussolini's forces had been pitched into a campaign of their own against another industrialized modern state, as opposed to terrorizing armies barely out of the 15th century, as in Ethiopia. The invasion of Egypt was the first where Italian generals had had to plan a campaign, rather than ride to victory on the backs of others, as they had when Italy belatedly joined the invasion of France. Mussolini's fascist state had proudly boasted that it had created a new, powerful, modern armed force, a military might that would rival and surpass that of ancient Rome. The history of World War II shows that these armies were not successors of the legions and Mussolini was no Caesar Augustus. The truth was, that although vastly expanded in number with splendid uniforms and no more or less brave than most soldiers of the time, Italy's troops were poorly equipped. What good modern weapons the country possessed were spread so thinly as to be useless. The body of men 230,000 strong that attacked Egypt was more of a 19th century force than a modern mobile armored army. The Italians slowly attacked moved inside the Egyptian border, and after three days, halted, waiting for more supplies to catch up. If the aim of Italy's Egyptian attack was in part to deny Britain oil, the Axis made moves of its own to ensure security of supply. In October, German forces moved into Romania, a move made to guarantee the Axis the only source of oil in the European mainland. This was not an invasion. Romania was a dictatorship and already sympathetic to the Nazis. In Europe, the war continued to spread to more and more European nations. As so often in the history of the European continent, the Balkans, that crazy patchwork of small countries with a multitude of confused minorities and minute ethnic differences, torn by ancient vendettas, hatreds, enmities, and grievances, was to play a part. A small Balkan conflict began, which was to be part of a far greater significance in the big picture of the history of the war. On October 28th, Italy invaded Greece, basing its attack from the neighboring territory of Albania, which Italy had occupied since April 1939. This was a war with little purpose other than the pride, vanity, and ego of Mussolini. To create a new Roman Empire, to avenge the loss of the tiny Ionian island of Corfu to Greece in 1923, and to show Hitler that Italy was not to be the junior party to the Axis. The invasion of Greece made little sense in terms of the bigger strategic picture. The invasion was to widen the war in a way that hindered Axis plans. Hitler looked toward a historical destiny of an eventual titanic struggle with Stalin's Soviet communist Russia, a war he saw central to the future of civilization.
Mussolini's sideshow would drag his German ally into a mire of troubles that would, in the end, help decide the outcome of the war. In the North Atlantic, the pressure from U-boat attacks was mounting to ever greater levels. There was a tremendous shortage of convoy escorts of the small warships that could shepherd the groups of merchantmen across the ocean. The United States had a vast store of near obsolete World War I destroyers known as the Four Stackers for their distinctive design. American President Roosevelt struck a ruthless deal with Churchill to receive the use of these spare ships as an instant enlargement to the Royal Navy. The British had to sign away control of their bases in the West Indies and Canada, giving them to the US. Roosevelt did not wish to appear to be violating U.S. neutrality, and his hard-headed assessment was that Britain was likely to fall. The American president feared that a future Britain, now in the Nazi camp, would allow German warships and German U-boats to be based in the Caribbean. It was a deal of which the U.S. obtained the best part. By the end of 1940, only nine of the promised destroyers had arrived. Looking back on the events of 1940, we think of the year as part of the unfolding drama of World War II. Of course, to the people of 1940, it was not yet a world war. It was rather a European war. The transition to global conflict was yet to be made. With hindsight, again, the growth of the war to envelop the world was inevitable. But again, this did not seem the case in 1940. In September, while the Battle of Britain was reaching its height on the other side of the world, the Empire of Japan was marching on its path to war. Crucially, Japan took the decision to attach its destiny to that of Hitler, joining the Axis Alliance. Why should Japan do this? What had Japan in common with Nazism, an ideology of racial superiority of white European peoples? Japan had felt threatened by the 1939 Nazi-Soviet alliance, a move which had taken Japan totally by surprise. The Soviet Union was a strategic threat to Japan's ambitions on mainland Asia, in China and Manchuria. The driving forces of Japanese policy were the army and navy. By allying with the Nazis, Japan saw the northern Soviet threat nullified. Japan saw an oncoming war with the United States as inevitable, and after the fall of France and Holland, believed the resources of the European colonies of Southeast Asia would be needed to fight a war against a strong industrial power. Across an ocean from the struggles of Europe, in the United States, a realization of the direction which history was flowing led America to introduce conscription in peacetime for the first time. We have come to realize that the greatest attack that has ever been launched against freedom of the individual is nearer the Americas than ever before. The Selective Service Act registered American men and some were chosen for military service. The service of the draftees was restricted to the Western Hemisphere and U.S. territories. But the act was an important step to preparing the United States for inevitable conflict. The growing, expanding nature of the European war was the dominant issue of the 1940 presidential election in America. In a broadcast, days before the election, Franklin Roosevelt promised the American people, your boys will not die in foreign wars. This promise helped Roosevelt win a record third term in office. FDR's place in American history as one of the greatest of peacetime presidents was already assured. His even greater place as a war leader was something that still awaited both him and America.